My name is Liston Lee, and I'm the principal advisor to the director of the U.S. National Maritime Intelligence Integration Office. NIMEO is a small organization with the U.S. federal government's intelligence community that was born as a result of the 9-11 attacks. Our mission is to provide a whole of government solution to maritime information sharing challenges. NIMEO neither collects nor produces intelligence. Rather, we break down barriers to sharing information and creating enabling structures to set the conditions for maritime partners to optimally share data. NIMEO works at the national and international levels to facilitate the integration of maritime information in support of maritime domain objectives to include the impacts to economic and commercial activities at sea. It's an honor for me to be here today and moderate this morning's panel, especially surrounded by so many maritime scholars, experts, and practitioners representing 26 friendly nations. The expansion of economic and commercial activities at sea is critical to our global economic stability, and there are many enduring and new challenges that we must all collectively address. Some examples of enduring challenges include the ramifications of misinterpretation of the UN Convention on the, on the Law of Sea Treaty when nations compete for resources in the same region. Another example is the evolving trends in international shipping, where the continued negative effects of the Great Recession have put a drag on global demand and financing for both ship owners and ship builders. A third example is the shifts in global production patterns, either through the discovery of shale gas in North America or the opening up of new sea routes in the Arctic, or even the expansion of the Panama Canal, which will alter global trading patterns by making an all-water route between Asia and the U.S. East Coast accessible to larger vessels. Since I started my current job earlier this year, three new challenges have emerged, which I will summarize as Ukraine, ISIS, and Ebola. Each of these has a potential negative impact on global maritime economic stability, as well as challenges to global maritime security. Therefore, it is imperative that all of us here today continue to work collaboratively to ensure a strong maritime partnership within the Indo-Asia Pacific region. With that in mind, I want to introduce our distinguished panel members who represent different areas within the study of global maritime economic issues. First up will be Dr. Claude Caudois, who is the Deputy Director, Research Center on Enterprise Networks, Logistics, and Transportation at Montreal University. Claude will be discussing seaborne container trade and Pacific Rim security. His presentation is designed to elicit some key issues for everyone here to consider, focusing on how naval forces respond to the needs arising from global supply chain imperatives. Next up will be Mr. Alexander Metalisa, an industry economist at the U.S. Energy Information Administration in Washington, D.C. Alex will be discussing maritime oil trade and the South China Sea. His presentation gives an introduction to maritime oil transit through the lens of global energy security and present, presents the South China Sea as a case study. To conclude our presentations will be Mr. Alex Walker, Vice President of Operations Retired, Chevron Shipping. Alex will be discussing creating a military merchant marine partnership. His presentation is designed to discuss the need for Asian navies to leverage industry expertise to better secure 
global commerce. Claude, over to you. Thank you. Okay, I've been tasked to overview some of the security issues of activities at sea. Of course, given the magnitude of shipping activities, I've decided to concentrate on container shipping. Okay. Now, for the past 30 years, there has been growth in international seaborne trade. The volume has increased from 3 billion to 9 billion tons. The average annual growth rate is about 3%. International trade is growing faster than global GDP. And the main factor of growth is container. Now, the ton miles associated with global trade has doubled over the same period to reach 48 billion ton miles. This suggests that distant markets are increasingly being integrated in the global economy. Now, more insight may be gained by examining the geography of world seaborne trade. Approximately 40% of loaded freight and 60% of unloaded freight is occurring in Asia. There are two components to this. One is the global trade with Asia, and the second is intra-Asia trade. Containerization is a key feature of global processes. Container trade has increased three folds over the past 15 years to reach 155 million TUs carried by ships. Despite year on, year on, year on changes following various economic cycles, container trade remains very robust. Analysis of change in world container ports reveals key dynastic features. In 1990, six out of 10 of the 10 top container ports were in Asia, with the top ports handling above 5 million containers. In 2012, seven out of the 10 top container ports are in China. Over 20% of global container ports throughput is handled in five ports, Shanghai, Singapore, Hong Kong, Changshan, and Pusan. The current benchmark for top container port is to handle above 30 million containers. Concomitant, concomitant with this trend, we can, uh, we can acknowledge several points. First, the world's container fleet has shown continual growth over the past 20 years. The number of vessels has increased for all size classes. One of the striking features is the growth of size of vessels. There are currently over 2,000 vessels above 8,000 TU in service. In, 20, in 2006, Maersk launched the Emma Maersk, an 11,000 TU ship that requires 10 gantry cranes. In 2013, CMA CGM launched the Jules Verne, a 16,000 TU capacity ship. Its leadership was surpassed a few weeks later when Maersk announced that it was ordering 20 triple E class of 18,000 TUs. The Korean shipyards have already laid plans for, to build a 22,000 TU vessel. Now the question is, where are those ships going? 
We've analyzed the movement of all vessels above 10,000 TU. The configuration of mega container vessels, shipping services, is committed to the east-west trade across Suez. The network structure takes the form of a pendulum service between Europe and China. This is beginning to change as Costco has a Costco vessel landed in Prince Rupert uh, carrying 13,000 TU. The analysis reveals the importance of container shipping lines calling at ports recognized as important source of cargo for import, for export, and for transshipment. Mega vessels are connecting these hubs at the edge of continent with north-south traffic. As you will certainly appreciate, the relationship between draft and capacity becomes a key issue for ports involved in container trade. There's a demand to provide deeper water access for ever larger ships. Now, port authorities around the world have taken up the challenge. Shanghai's capacity problems were solved by the construction of a new port site in Hangzhou Bay. This led to the modification of the Yangshan Islands landscape, with the building of a new port having 52 berths. The Chinese built a 32-kilometer bridge to connect with shore-based container terminal. They built the bridge in 36 months. Shanghai is not unique. Expansion plans can be found elsewhere in Asia, in Europe, and the Caribbean. This is leading to global competition for the establishment of gateways as modern economic growth machine. The new infrastructural arena brings to light the commutative connections of deep sea liner shipping with tangential feeder services and inland freight corridors. The analysis of mega vessel movement and port development confirms the hierarchy of trade routes. We have observed a cascading effect as shipping lines and ship owners are making use of their assets. Larger vessels are deployed on lesser trade lanes, and there's a general increase in vessel size on all major shipping routes. Examination of vessel size evolution in East Asia reveals that over the past decade, vessel capacity has increased. Pursuing, pursuing our analysis, we examine 40,000 shipping services along key trans-Pacific trade corridors. There's a clear distinction between North America and East Asia, with larger, larger vessels and more calling patterns in Asia. Asia. Asia is characterized by increasing share of global traffic, both for local demand and supply, and second, for transshipment functions are becoming much more acute. More importantly, more importantly, we have examined the calling frequencies on trans-Pacific trade routes. What you have to understand is that over 10% of container vessels servicing Pacific facade are crossing Panama and Suez. In other words, a ship can leave Shanghai, go to Prince Rupert, cross Panama, go to Rotterdam, goes back to New York, cross Panama again, goes to LA before going back to Shanghai. There are cost competitiveness in linking the Atlantic and the Pacific 
ocean. By the way, I hope you like my maps because it took me a long time to draw. In addition, the industry has adopted specific practices in relation to rising bunker cost and excess capacity by reducing speed. 43% of all container services involve slow steaming, especially along Europe Far East route, where slow steaming accounts for 75% of all services. It's like if you had a conveyor belt between Europe and China. Now these trends are calling upon naval forces in several issues. Vessels are operating in high traffic density coastal areas. There are more frequent trips, container ship Casualties seem to persist despite technical improvements, and casualties to larger vessels may lead to significant financial consequences. As the number of maritime passages are limited, and the number and size of vessel moving through these passages increases, any traffic interruptions affect the global economy. Already, corporate risk premium for weather-related issues are in force as vessels are navigating in either hazardous meteorological conditions or along high-density coastal areas. Another threat to welfare and security of seafarers is increasing piracy. Hotspots can be identified along the Malacca Strait and off Kalimantan Island. This leads to the need for increased vigilance by naval forces that, has to, that have to police offshore waters the same way soldiers are policing land. This is very serious as Asian manufacturing continues to move from China to Southeast Asian countries. Another issue, too often neglected, is time determinant. We have measured turnaround time by vessel size. Punctuality is a key dimension in transit time. And there are serious discrepancies between North America and East Asian ports displaying higher productivity. The Panama Canal expansion may not be the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge may be the need to upgrade onshore port infrastructure in North America. Terminal planning is organized around the arrival slots awarded to each services. Late arrivals precipitate adjustments that have to be made that may be difficult and lead to congestion problems. Now, why is this important? Supply chain are designed around expected arrivals and departure of vessels. On-time deliveries are crucial for liners to remain competitive. Port authorities, terminal operators, are adopting a wide range of strategies to cope with potential disruptions in service schedule. Naval forces have to be aware that the industry is monitoring ocean transit, port dwell time, land bridge movement to final destination. They do this in order to identify the weak link in the supply chain, to assess port capacity, and to target investment priorities. Now, the integration of China in global economic marketplace is leading to a shift in Chinese leadership real politic from a continental to a maritime dynamic. 
China is asserting its sovereign rights over territorial waters. They are increasing security needs of strategic passages in the South China Seas. There are investment in various types of facilities in the Indian Ocean. But as you could appreciate on the table, any delays in maritime traffic can be very costly. For example, in this case, if a ship cannot go to Malacca, has to go to the Sunda Strait or the Lombok Strait for one trip, say, to Suez, from Suez to uh, uh, Korea, the cost can increase by half a million dollars for one trip. There are very few existing mechanisms for paging to manage maritime risk with other governments. There are problems in terms of communication mechanism, interception procedures, or secure command structures. But the system is more complex than it looks. There are major game changers in container trade. The privatization process has led to new ownership structure in Asia's container terminals. There's a need to understand the strategies of global terminal operators as they can offer global coverage. For example, Hutchison Port Holding is hiving off container operations in the Pearl River Delta. The Port of Singapore Authority controls terminals in China. This is leading to changing calling patterns, and some ports may lose traffic while others may gain. Now, the future of naval forces is very promising. The general trend is that you're going to have trade growth and emerging markets, increasing vessel size, significant extra capacity. The response that is now emerging in terms of new spatial patterns correspond to cascading effect and slow steaming, new ocean service configuration, and gateway formation and transshipment geography. Contained trade security will address environmental issues, sea lane choke points, container supply chain, and understanding of global stakeholders' geography. There's a need to monitor the routes, the capacity of ports, and especially the fluidity of the supply chain. In an environment of changes, Navy is instrumental in the functioning of global economic processes. Thank you.